Welcome again to the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies, located on the unceded territory of the Lenape people. And welcome to our panel, No Bosses, No Borders, Anti-Capitalism and Migrant Justice Organizing. So again, our panel is co-sponsored by the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and the Cornell Migrations Initiative. And um, please use the Q&A tab on the bottom, as Michael um, um, said, we I look forward to your questions and you can start putting them there uh, in the middle. You don't have to wait until the end. The United States continues to exploit, criminalize, detain and deport immigrants, regardless of who's in the White House. Even as the US government is dropping mask mandates and proclaiming the COVID-19 pandemic to be over, it continues to expel migrants at the US border, specifically as a COVID threat using the Title 42 policy. In the last two weeks, um, we have seen an immense outpouring of sympathy and extension of protections to Ukrainians who are fleeing the Russian invasion. Yet it's difficult to ignore the way that this sympathy highlights the white supremacist status quo of migration policy in the countries of the global north and their treatment of other victims of imperial aggression and violence. Immigrant rights and migrant justice organizers continue to fight against the cruelties and injustices of the immigration systems in the US and beyond. And this is a diverse movement. Different political analyses of the situation and there are different ideas about effective strategies. Some organizing efforts more actively engage with critiques and um, critiques of and struggle against capitalism than others. And even as anti-capitalist analysis is embraced by more people in the US, large sections of the immigrant rights movement still shy away from connecting their work to any critique of capitalism. Um, this panel brings together three activists and thinkers whose cutting edge work and analysis pushes beyond the tired platitudes of hardworking, deserving and grateful immigrants. And they're joining us to think together about how to fight for migrant justice, and the post-capitalist future for all of us. So before I start us off with questions, let me do some quick introductions of our speakers. Each deserves much more than I will say, um, but just gonna go in the order on my screen. Um, Ashley Borer is a scholar activist who's based in Chicago, is an assistant professor of gender and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame. She works with the Center for Jewish Nonviolence, Jewish Voice for Peace and Never Again Action. Ashley's new book is called Marxism and Intersectionality, Race, Gender, Class, and Sexuality Under Contemporary Capitalism. Welcome, Ashley. Um, Ali Wayne is a migrant justice organizer based in Syracuse, New York. He works with the Syracuse Peace Council, which is a community-based autonomous anti-war social justice organization, as well as the Andaki Black Network, which is a multi-generational network of currently and formerly undocumented Black people. Welcome, Ali. Um, and finally, we have Justin Akers Chacon, who is an activist, labor unionist, and educator based in the San Diego Tijuana border region. Justin is a professor of US history and Chicano studies at San Diego City College. Justin's new book is called The Border Crossed Us The Case for Opening the US Mexico Border. And you can find the links to all of these in the chat. So we're so grateful to have you join us today. Um, and I wanna kick us off with kind of a, a basic starting question about migration and capitalism. How does capitalism shape migration and why is it important to take an anti-capitalist approach in the struggle for migrant justice? Feel free to jump in. I can go ahead and start if, if that's okay with my colleagues here. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for uh, hosting this event. Um, so uh, to answer the question, we have to understand how capitalism, I think, has has changed specifically within the last uh, four four or five decades, and specifically how uh, we've seen the restructuring of the global economy in various ways. And specifically in this part of the of the world in North America, we've seen uh, uh, the United States uh, government, but also in league with other 
capitalist nations and working through international institutions, essentially uh, reordering um, the, the global capitalist economy in a way that allows for the, in, in many ways, the forcible opening of, uh, of, of economies to allow for capital uh, export. And in the case of the United States and Mexico, for instance, and I would say by extension, Central America and the Caribbean and beyond, but especially starting with Mexico, uh, in, in, the, in the 1980s and 1990s, we see a, a, a kind of debt-induced um, restructuring that has allowed Mexico uh, to become the most open economy in the world for foreign investors. Um, and so Mexico today has the largest number of uh, what are called free trade agreements. Free trade agreements uh, essentially uh, are, are not free, <laughs> nor are they agreements, but they're, they're rather imposed um, relationships of inequality that allow for capital export financialization and, and essentially a form of economic colonialism that allows for massive uh, uh, shifts of capital um, into countries like Mexico. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and a couple of things result from this. One is that we see, uh, you know, U.S. capital and by extension, international capital taking over large sections of the, of the Mexican economy um, across, across industries. And, um, and as a result, we see uh, a, a process in which wealth is generated and transferred uh, back to the United States in the form of, of profit. Um, but, uh, but also in the, in the form of accumulating more capital so that more, more capital can be invested. And I'll, and I'll just say that by, and conclude here that ultimately uh, this, this arrangement um, of, tr of wealth transfer uh, leads, creates the conditions where people are economically displaced um, and forced to, to essentially uproot and, and migrate. So, um, so when we talk about how capitalism operates uh, internationally through these free trade agreements, it's it's really uh, you know wealth transfer, economic displacement, and then and then we see coinciding with that uh, another form of capital accumulation, which is the criminalization of of of, of, of migrants and the uh, super exploitation of their labor under conditions of crimin criminality in in places like the United States. And so this model has been exported and 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 developed uniquely in other parts of the world as well. But the, but really this is a way of understanding why millions of people, really hundreds of millions of people have been economically displaced in the last few decades specifically. So we have to understand the way capitalism has restructured um, the global, uh, you know, the, these relations internationally and the way politics uh, have reflected the, the you know, uh, legitimizing and, and, and re, re, uh, entrenching and restructuring and, and basically uh, normalizing uh, this process uh, you know, especially here in, in North America. Absolutely. Thank you for highlighting those processes and emphasizing the changes in the last four decades, for sure. Um, Ali, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, if I could elaborate on that. First of all, I just wanted to say it's really an honor to be on this panel with Ashley, who used to be my Syracuse neighbor and whose work I really appreciate, and with Justin, who is just someone whose work um, has really inspired me. Um, it's so an honor to be in this panel. I'm not an academic. I am still currently an undocumented activist, really started out working on this issue because I was affected by it doing anti-deportation work, you know, in the mid 2000s. And then sort of as I started to dig into this issue, this issue I started to realize, you know, just it just kept getting bigger and bigger in terms of finger, trying to figure out the analysis that led us to this place of criminalization. Um, an anti-capitalist, uh, framing is absolutely necessary to understanding what's happening with migration flows just across the globe. Um, it's actually interesting that, you know, this the, the, the title of this panel is No Borders, you know, No Bosses. And, and, you know, in this country, when we talk about immigration, we're always talking about, you know, border security, border security. The, the reality is that for multinational corporations, you know, for them, there's no borders. You know, capital moves freely from country to country without any kind of restrictions. Um, you know, I'll just flesh out a little bit of what Justin was saying, trying to, you know, I'll, I'll use the North America uh, free trade agreement as an example in terms of how this has disrupted flows of, um, of labor. 
you know, when the North American Free Trade Agreement was passed, which I think was under Clinton back in 1994, what that allowed for was for uh, corporations to move freely to other countries in order to find basically cheaper labor. I think that the term that they used at the time was like flexible labor or something like that, but just basically more exploitable, cheaper labor. And what ended up happening was that a lot of the manufacturing companies that used to be in the south of the US, they moved their factories down to Mexico in order to find cheaper labor. And then when wages started to rise in Mexico, those same corporations moved their factories then to uh, Southeast Asia. And what that ended up creating was this incredible imbalance. You know, a lot of people in Mexico who had been working in these factories were then left without jobs. Uh, but it also pit sort of poor U.S. workers against poor Mexican workers. And a lot of these Mexican workers traveled north in order to seek labor. And that created this kind of divide and conquer between poor U.S. workers and poor Mexican undocumented workers. But the ultimate culprit is capitalism. And that's the thing that's kind of the, 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 the crazy making thing about US politics is oftentimes domestically, we tend to think of like, you know, well, it's poor US workers versus, you know, undocumented workers, you know, trying to uh, steal US jobs. But the overall project is that capitalism is exploiting both US workers and undocumented workers from other countries. And we need to ask ourselves who the, the, the biggest culprits are and the biggest culprits of of all of this is basically capitalism. Capitalism trying to find cheaper, more exploitable labor. I believe that the um, term that a lot of people use is called the, I think the race to the bottom where multinational corporations basically go from country to country trying to find the cheapest, most exploitable labor at the expense of, of those of us who are workers. And so I think as we do migrant rights organizing, one of the things that we have to have a baseline principle of is, well, if capital gets, if capital gets to move from country to country in order to find this you know, more exploitable labor, then we need to fight for the rights of workers to move from country to country just as freely as capital. That is just a basic principle of justice. And so that's one of the pieces where anti-capitalist framing is really useful for us to get a, a better sense of uh, how to move forward in terms of migrants' rights justice, and I'll just leave it at that for right now. I mean, I totally agree with everything that both Justin and Ali um, said. I think just to add a few a few other pieces to this story about the, the interpenetration of capitalism and migration, I think it's really helpful to remember that historically, like the rise of capitalism as a world system was dependent on the migration of Europeans to the Western Hemisphere and like the movement of um, right of, of settler colonization um, in order to enable the kind of free movement of capital, the theft of resources, the theft of land that um, the migrant justice movement, the indigenous rights movement, and several other movements are are also still trying to fight that like the grammar of the contemporary relationship between migration and capitalism that is so mm, yoked in this completely repressive and exploitative relationship is itself based on a prior freedom of movement right in a in a totally settler colonial and racist way um, that i think sort of tells us something about the absolute interpenetration between migration politics and, and capitalism, both historically and in our present moment. Um, I think one of the, the other things that I really think is important to highlight about capitalism and migration is that, you know, even beyond thinking about capitalism as a system just of exploitation, which of course it is, capitalism is also a system that is totally dependent on the creation of sort of differentiated subject positions that can be pitted against each other. This is how capitalism reproduces itself. And it's how we inherit narratives and cultural explanations for inequality. And one of the central ways in the contemporary world that those divisions are created and maintained over time is through the differentiation of status and citizenship and the control of borders and movement. Um, 
I think we can sort of talk about this as like capitalism's deep dependence on not just the exploitation that workers um, both documented and doc documented and undocumented experience, but also on the oppression that goes into the creation of a differentiated system of hierarchy and inequality that so many migrants, um, both documented and undocumented, are subjected to. Um, I think we can also talk about the way that very particular kinds of labor, including social reproduction labor is very heavily structured through migration, um, especially in the global north, where so much of the daily work that is required in order to reproduce um, the population in terms of cooking, cleaning, child care, and elder care is performed predominantly by racialized migrants and especially racialized migrant women of color. Um, who are so central in um, spe specifically the care portion of the economy. And as we know, capitalism is itself dependent on the erasure of the value and the centrality of that labor um, in both its paid and its unpaid um, you know, variations. Um, lastly, I think we could also talk about the way that um, capitalism through neo-colonial policies like structural adjustment and neo-imperial institutions like the World Bank and the IMF have really wreaked absolute havoc um, on the global south that places many countries in the position of depending on remittances um, from migrant labor in order to you know, reproduce themselves, right, in order for basic uh, survival in order to take place. And so we can think about these large global structures of capitalist sort of transnational economy themselves motivating um, migration, but also the way in which migration is sometimes the only survival mechanism that capitalism has, has left for people. And so we can see the sort of influence and interpenetration of capitalism and migration on both ends. And so in order, I think, for the super exploitation, as well as the oppression that go into the current system in order to be alleviated, um, we would have to do away with capitalism sort of wholesale. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you um, for providing this analysis that just, it just makes it so clear um, the necessity of looking and working beyond the US borders, as well as digging in deeper into the processes that are ostensibly happening within the US borders, but are so uh, inescapably connected to global capitalism. I think that you've all highlighted that. And, and also the way that citizenship is used as a labor technology, right? Um, with, you know, which may, makes you think in a different way about kind of the, the calls to establish paths to citizenship or even, you know, one of our ads in the beginning for citizenship now, <laughs> uh, uh, assistance, right? Um, so with that in mind, um, can we think about uh, the migrant justice and immigrant rights movements in the US and beyond that are going on right now? And what role do you see anti-capitalist struggles playing in those movements? Maybe perhaps any examples of anti-capitalist organizing that you see in uh, immigrant rights or migrant justice work that you would like to highlight? Um, so I wouldn't mind just uh, jumping in real quick on this one, just because I heard the phrase citizenship as labor technology, which I love that. That's really interesting. Um, you know, even in, in sort of at, before this panel got started, there were a couple of great music pieces. One of them was uh, Immigrants Who Get the Job Done by the rapper Kanan, which I, I love. I love that song. It's really great. But like, what does that say, right? That's how we, we configure immigrants is, is as labor producing subjects. And that's been, I think, the problem with what I think that the broader immigrants rights movement, you know, in general, is that it has accepted largely that narrative. Um, you know, most immigrants rights policy is centered around creating uh, labor producing subjects. Uh, 
And that's the problem because <laughs> immigrants are a lot more than that, you know? And, and, you know, as a veteran of these movements, boy, I can tell you, I went through my own battles with folks within the mainstream movement around this. I remember back in, I don't know if it was 2012 or 2013, the last push for immigration reform, you know, as an undocumented person, especially as an undocumented and black person, you know, I was kind of a commodity in the movement. And one of the campaigns that I participated in, uh, and I'm not going to name it because I'm not into sort of shaming campaigns, but one of the things that they asked us to do was to produce videos uh, with the background of an American flag, where we would basically, you know, talk to the American public and tell them why we deserve to be here. <laughs> and, you know, I was just like, yeah, no, that's, that's never going to happen. I'm not going <laughs> to participate in that. But the whole narrative was basically, show us your value, you know, and really it was in order to create this narrative of the productive labor producing immigrant. And that's been the, the, the major, major, um, I think, failure of the mainstream immigration reform movement is instead of creating critiques of capitalism that go to the heart of why we are criminalized as undocumented people, we buy into it. And we try to create narratives of deserving immigrants who are labor producing immigrants in order to appease the US public, as opposed to addressing critiques of capitalism, as opposed to addressing uh, critiques of American nationalism, American imperialism that are creating these flows of immigration that are not going to stop until we get at these foundational roots, you know. Um, so, I mean, that was just a really quick thing that I wanted to, to share. And in terms of like examples of um, great anti-capitalists, you know, organizing, I mean, there's the classic example of the coalition of Immokalee workers, you know, folks who have been doing some uh, great work empowering um, uh, farm, farm workers, mostly in Florida, to go after multinational corporations to be able to, to, you know, to get decent wages. And one of the reasons why the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, by the way, is so powerful and it emerged as such a powerful anti-capitalist, you know, uh, campaign is that many of the migrants who came here to do some farm work came from countries often in Latin America, Haiti, countries that had been subject to American imperialism. And so they came with experience of anti-imperialist union experience. And that allows, allowed them to forge the kind of anti-capitalist critique that helped uh, sort of create sort of powerful uh, organizing. So I'll just leave that one example. There are a couple of other really good examples of great anti-capitalist migrant rights movement, but uh, migrant rights organizing, but um, just wanted to share that real quick. And, yeah. Thank you. And thank you for, for the critique of one of our opening songs. Um, it, it is definitely um, something to see, like even in progressive circles, the reduction of immigrant value to uh, immigrant labor, right? And we can think of uh, everything that leaves out uh, as far as humanity and human value <laughs> goes, right? Even, you know, you don't have to think too hard to think about people who are not understood as, you know, workers for wages, uh, but also disabled people, children, the elderly. Um, and what does it do to reduce our, to premise our fight for migrant justice on migrant labor. Right. Um, Ashley and Justin, did, did you want to weigh in on this question? Yeah, um, yeah, great points made. Uh, thank you for those insights. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and I think, you know, in my case, I'll just be adding to the excellent points that are being being made. Um, I don't I don't have any. Um, I, I, you know, I want to build on it. <clears throat> um, you know, when we talk about uh, the concept of anti-capitalist struggle in, um, in the U.S. Uh, in particular, um, I you know I think there's uh, a couple ways that we can understand what that means. Uh, you know, for those out, you know, the, for those trying to understand what 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 this what the implications of of anti-capitalist struggle are. So we live in a in a in a in a society where we have two two capitalist parties that essentially share. 
a, a consensus about you know both domestic and foreign policy, and especially um, as they pertain to capital accumulation um, and and profiting um, from the exploitation of labor. So uh, the way I would situate um, you know uh, understanding you know the the, the nature of cap anti capital struggle is in the class struggle is in is in the the way in which uh, working wor working people um, you know uh, interna international working class people with uh, within the U S um, essentially and you know and the and the left uh, the the socialist anarchist radical communist etc left um, being a, a part of this but essentially the class struggle being uh, developed through uh, work, working class struggle at the point of production. And then I would also locate it in terms of uh, confrontations or organizing to confront the state itself, because the state essentially is, uh, you know, the facilitator of, of, of you know, sort of capitalist uh, um, accumulation and, um, you know, and, and the extension of, of, of the, uh, the interests of the capitalist class internationally. So um, when we talk about class struggle in the U.S., Specifically, I would I would locate uh, that at you know in, in terms of how workers have taken action in, in various forms in recent years, especially in recent years, some of which I document in the book uh, I just wrote. Um, you know, uh, for instance, uh, if we start in the receiving countries themselves, um, you know, uh, Haiti, uh, as uh, Ali Ali pointed out, um, you know, uh, the nations that are. Uh, victimized, right, by by ec this, these forms of economic colonization, displacement. Um, Haiti, uh, in the last few years, we've seen a, a, a significant uh, struggle of the working classes of Haiti rising up against its own government with a very clear and, uh, and you know, uh, cons a very precise understanding of the nature of, of, the, of, the, of the conditions that ha Haitian workers face in Haiti being uh, a reflection of the government and uh, its alliance uh, in collaboration with the U.S., you know, which, which essentially means Haiti has turned in, has been turned into a, a sweatshop, essentially a sweatshop nation, just like many other nations, you know, Mexico and, and Central America. And so there have been uh, workers uprisings there in the last few years, including a general strike um, against, uh, prior to the assassination of the, pre of the previous government, against that government, for its compliance in perpetuating the the policies that keep wages at starvation level, uh, we've seen in Honduras recently uh, the 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 defeat of the right far right wing U.S. aligned government of Juan uh, Orlando Hernandez, um, and uh, prior to that, for several years, workers in that country had been organizing against the privatization of their health care system. Um, and their education system, which was heavily funded and supported by U.S. Uh, capitalist, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, these sort of, sort of think tank groups, um, Bill and Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, et cetera. Um, and there had been, uh, uh, you know, general strikes there that, and other forms of movement under extremely repressive conditions where people are, you know, disappeared and killed uh, through state, state violence. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, challenging the conditions of capitalist, you know, displacement, um, you know, at, in their own homes. And then, of course, in the United States, we've seen um, various examples of uh, struggle that uh, are taking on the question of capitalism in the state. Uh, you know, the, the Occupy Wall Street movement, of, uh, you know, over a decade ago had reverberations all the way up into uh, 2018 when uh, opposition to to Trump's policies around uh, migrant criminalization and incarceration uh, produced something called the Occupy uh, ICE movement, where in, in uh, over a dozen cities around the United States, activists um, sort of surrounded and tried to literally blockade ICE de uh, detention and transfer centers across the country if, and shutting down uh, several of them, uh, including in Portland, um, you know, for, for weeks and even months, uh, essentially uh, literally uh, confronting the, the state and, and trying to shut down its operations. A couple more examples. Um, um, we've seen labor struggle uh, also in the last few years. We've seen workers in the tech industry walking out, shutting down uh, operations 
uh, you know, and 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 articulating a critique of their government uh, of their of their companies, Google, um, you know, the the biggest Microsoft, the, you know, the biggest multinational uh, tech companies, basically um, protesting and, and and calling for uh, the 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 sort of divestment from contracts with ICE, from contracts with the government that criminalize Im immigrants. Uh, we've seen workers on both sides of the border begin uh, to organize transnational collaborations, union union campaigns, uh, uh, boycotts, um, essentially um, recognizing that capital, uh, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about supply chain. There's been a lot of discussion about supply chain disruption. Well, supply chain pr uh, production is essentially capital moving stages of production to, to uh, across borders to find cheap, cheap wages, as people have already mentioned. Um, so it's not some some innovative technique to to improve the, the the processes of production and make it you know better for the for the consumer. It's it's to increase the the rate of exploitation of workers across borders. And so workers have been organizing across these supply chains in U.S. and Mexico, for instance, and organizing strikes. The largest agricultural strikes um, in uh, you know the West Coast uh, in history have happened in the last uh, eight, seven to eight years. Um, you know, going uh, spreading from Baja California um, up to the to the uh, Washington State uh, workers along this, these agricultural corridors, these and these agro-industrial export centers. Uh, so there's a lot of examples where we can see that struggle. And I'm sorry, I'm going on, but lastly, I just want to mention the abolitionist struggle, which is a really um, a, a very big part now of of the movement, which reflects learning from and aligning with. The black freedom struggle, you know, uh, going back uh, some time to the idea of like prison abolition, and 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 then we see it, it evolve into a national campaign to abolish ICE. And just yesterday, I was part of a collective that was protesting at the Otay Mesa Detention Center, which is a for-profit, privately run detention center here in San Diego County. And that was, you know, the the demand of the movement was we need to sh we need to abolish detention centers. We need to shut down the, these these systems that that. Um, criminalize and detain and uh, incarcerate in order to make profit. So there's a lot of examples of how class struggle and confrontation with the state are, are raising the question of, you know, how do we how do we get beyond the, you know, these oppressive systems by by recognizing and confronting capital and the architects, uh, you know, through the state who promote these policies of, of, of you know, degradation and exploitation. All of this, I think, is is totally right. Just to add, like a, a a little bit, I think one of the framings that is helpful for me um, to sort of think about the larger context in which we might talk about the term migrant justice, rather than say something like migrant recognition or migrant incorporation. So there are there have been tons of campaigns that whose like horizon of thought or vision extends only into incorporating migrants into the system as it is, rather than transforming the system into what we know it could be. Um, and I would, I would talk about this like sort of latter approach that in order to really get justice for migrants and for immigrant people, we need not just to, for example, grant status, sure we need to find, but let, there are larger systems of transformation that are necessary, and those include uprooting things like global capitalism, the abolition of borders, the abolition of police, and actual reparation and restitution for the grave harms of settler colonization and all of the other forms of sort of human confinement that this particular system and the imbrication of capitalism and um, borders has required. And so one of the things I think is really useful in pushing forward this conversation as a sort of like um, heuristic or framing device is like toward what does a struggle aspire? And if it is only something like the, the immediate amelioration of circumstance within a system, I think we might wanna move away from calling that migrant justice and using the term migrant justice to really gesture toward this larger project, which by nature has to be anti-capitalist because of the deep imbrication of um, injustice uh, toward, toward migrants and many other people in capitalism. Thank you for that, Ashley. Um... I think that is such an important distinction, right? I have kind of been saying immigrant rights and migrant justice in the same sentence, but those are two different things, right? And, um, you know, the 
thinking about these terms um, it is part of imagining uh, you know, tr more transformative visions, which I think you have laid out very powerfully right now, Ashley. And I also want to you know, highlight something that Justin said, which is the role of the state in the enforcement of capitalism. And I would also add um, the role of the military. So the role, you know, when Justin was talking about Honduras and Haiti, you know, the, the role that the US military has played in enforce, enforcing capitalist extraction and exploitation in just those two, but in many more, of course, um, regions of the world, um, it, you know, to me seems like an essential part of, uh, of the struggle as well. Um, but okay, so we've, we've kind of all touched upon some of our larger visions for incorporating anti-capitalist analysis into migrant justice work. Let's make it a little bit more concrete. So if, um, if you had to think of some immediate anti-capitalist short-term objectives that we could organize around, um, what might that look like? Do, can, can we think of some kind of next steps with the big vision in mind? Transnational revolutionary general strike tomorrow, bam. No, I mean, I think it's really hard, right? Because I think in a certain sense, um, unlike um, let's say a reform oriented strategy, when we're talking about like, what do we do that is anti-capitalist, right? Like in a certain sense, socialism or whatever your favorite word for the anti-capitalist sort of vision we're fighting for, it, is sort of like either we're there or we're not. There are, um, I'm a big believer in taking, let's say transformative steps in the present so that we can birth the world that we wanna see. And so we can learn how to interact with each other in ways beyond um, what capitalism dictates to us. But creating something like an anti-capitalist world is not, is not a short-term strategy, I don't think, especially because in the contemporary world, the, the complete interpenetration of um, capitalism and empire across the globe means that it is not, it doesn't feel feasible to say abolish capitalism or attenuate capitalism in one place at a time, right? This in a certain sense has to be a coalitional transnational movement of workers against the source of their exploitation and oppression which I think also necessitates the abolition of borders, but also the abolition of um, the various other sort of, let's say, um, modes of oppression that capitalism benefits of and that's from, and that so often breaks bonds of solidarity. Like I think Ali was talking about this earlier, that part of the way that capitalism is able to proceed and reproduce itself is through the sort of um, inherited antipathy of groups of workers who have, you know, sort of inherited this idea that um, workers or groups of workers are in competition with each other when actually the real source of their exploitation and therefore the adequate target of their organizing is the capitalist system, the bosses, the global 1%, whatever your favorite language is there. And so for me, I think rather than rather than there being a, a short-term next step, I think the needed change is something like a, a change of vision toward a more coalitional-based transnational organizing based in not necessarily sameness or um, you know, an exact equivalence between situations, but a recognition of linked fate and an understanding that movements against capitalist exploitation in one place have reverberating effects elsewhere, and that the only way that capitalism is going to be uprooted is globally. Yeah, those are great thoughts. And, and I mean, this is, it's, it's too much of a big elephant to just be like, well, here are the short term things, <laughs> you know, that we can do. But I, I have two thoughts around that in terms of the migrants' rights uh, movement. And by the way, I do want to highlight a while back as I started to really analyze sort of, you know, what we think of migrant rights, immigration reform, I realized that there were two tracks that organizers were on. There's the immigration reform movement, which is about having access to citizenship. 
And then there's the migrants' rights movement, which is actually based on trying to figure out how to create systems that are uh, that respect people's humanity. And those two conversations are very separate. They just aren't. The immigration reform movement, which is largely happening in D.C. and in Congress, is all about, um, yeah, citizenship. And I think that's actually the problem. I think that the migrants' rights movement has to have a critique of citizenship in and of itself, a critique of citizenship as potentially, if anything, a, a, a status that can tame our revolutionary order, you know. And those of us who are undocumented and Black, I, I like to call us the cynics <laughs> of the immigration reform movement, because, you know, like I could become a U.S. citizen tomorrow, right? I'm still going to be Black. Like I've still... I'm still going to be racially profiled, you know, I'm still going to get stopped by cops, all of those things. And so resorting to citizenship as some form of justice or safety in and of itself is a problem that needs to be critiqued. But in terms of sort of moving forward and organizing, I think Justin touched on it. To me, the framing that works the the, the best is the abolitionist framing. Um, I think that we in order to get a deeper understanding of these systems of exploitation, we need to... Okay, I'll just share that when I first started doing anti-deportation work, um, you know, I just couldn't understand uh, why we kept losing <laughs> these deportation cases, which I thought, you know, should be easy to win, because I looked at it from a perspective of uh, justice as opposed to what was happening, which is uh, a profit-making process. Um, and by that, I mean the same private prison corporations that uh, made a mint off of the incarceration of poor Black and brown folks under the so-called rubric of the war on drugs. All of a sudden, 9-11 happens, war on terror happens, those same private prison corporations start literally writing the pieces of legislation that, you know, that would lead people into incarceration and deportation. And if we don't have that lens that, you know, fighting against migrant detention is fighting against the broader prison industrial complex, then we're missing out on a big, big part of the problem. Um, I remember being at a conference between migrant rights organizers and, um, uh, you know, black and brown organizers who have been fighting against the prison industrial complex for a long time. And one of the most effective conversations that I had was there was this um, young African-American woman who basically shared with us and she was she is part of the sort of, you know, mass incarceration fight group. And she was just like, well, you know when you guys have people who are about to get deported or who are incarcerated, we show up at your rallies, you know, because we want to be in solidarity with you. But when our family members who are being detained because of criminal convictions, you know, all of those other things, when they're fighting for their rights of justice, you don't want to show up because in your mind, like we're the real criminals and you are the unjustly criminalized people, you know? And it was like, oh, it's a light bulb moment. You know, that like if we are actually going to move towards justice, we need to question the criminalization process as a whole. And so I think just in general, as a shorthand sort of moving forward, having a deeper abolitionist critique of the system, whether you're talking about prison, uh, immigration, the military, all of those, the abolitionist framing really helps us understand who we need to organize against, as opposed to accepting the system as is, because the system is an oppressive system as is. I mean, there's there's no way, ifs and buts about it. I mean, the immigration system that we have is an oppressive, uh, exploitative system that is simply about creating acceptable labor producing subjects. And that in and of itself is something that- yeah. Uh, I'll just add, um, I, I really agree, and I want to I want to pick out two points um, that were already made by uh, Ashley and Ali. Um, one is um, the uh, uh, when we talk about any kind of you know analysis of how do we in the short term for how do we understand how to build an, an, you know a sort of anti-capitalist orientation um, towards 
uh, international worker solidarity, we have to look at we have to look at things on, on an international scale. And then we I think we also have to understand solidarity um, is is essential to you know how, how we actually organize in all stages of, of the struggle, short term to long term. I would add a third point, which is um, we have to understand the, the nature if we're if we're talking about the U.S. system, the the U.S. centric global capitalist. Well, it's it's now fragmenting, or it's been fragmenting. But if we talk about the the U.S., we have to understand that we can't. Al I don't think it's possible to move an inch if we align ourselves with capitalist uh, political parties, or see that we have a path towards, um, ab you know, towards um, anti capitalism by aligning with you know. Uh, you know what 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 amounts to one of the most aggressive and long-standing capitalist political parties in you in, in world history which is the democratic party and and it's, and i'm i'm leaving i'm going to leave out the republican party i don't think i need to explain why that's you know why the republican party is not an ally but i think most of the immigrant rights movement um is either directly affiliated through to through the democratic party through funding mechanisms or independently aligns itself thinking that we could push uh, you know, push the party to the left, and therefore that's a path combined, even combined with struggle on the ground towards achieving um, some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of uh, process of dismantling um, the repressive state rep repressive apparatus. And so, I, you know, I would emphasize that there are also, um, you know, some 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 very clear ways that we can get involved right now, um, and there are there are ways that. Um, can put us uh, thinking in terms of being on the offensive towards an anti-capitalist movement, um, you know, uh, as part of uh, building a, wor a world without borders, um, and, and for full and equal so uh, rights and solidarity with all workers, regardless of, of citizenship status. Um, and then there's, but right now we're probably talking more about defense, uh, you know, a defensive struggle, right? Because uh, because of the the political economy uh, of the U.S. And because we're now sh shift, we're sh we've had these shifts towards um, you know uh, rising struggle that actually accomplished great great advances, and then and then and then the the electoral orientation um, that then brings the Democratic Party to power, the promises, the abandonment of those promises, and 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 then further criminalization, further militarization, further imper you know in, imperialist. The, the furthering of the imperialist project that then also creates the destabilization that we've been talking about. So um, that kind, you know, an, an independent orientation towards the class, the international working classes, and you know, the, the left, which is small, but you know, but needs to be organized um, and, the, and and also um, aligned uh, where we can with the the class struggle as it's expressing itself. So um, so working within unions to actually push. For um, an orientation towards uh, an abolitionist orientation, you know, regardless of which union you're in, uh, building solidarity with, uh, you know, undocumented immigrant workers, um, and you know, aligning uh, aligning the, the the work, you know, the 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 section of the class that you're integrated into with other sections of the class, and you know, there there, for instance, uh, I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, in 1986, there was an, an immigration reform that was the process, the uh, the product of two trajectories. One was uh, an immigrant rights movement that was calling for full legalization for all undocumented people, and the rising sort of right wing um, uh, trajectory towards beginning to militarize the border. And that was in that that con you know that sort of those two elements came together and. and in, in something that hasn't happened since, which was the passing of a immig comprehensive immigration policy, the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And I, I want to emphasize that unions played a significant role. Um, they haven't always, and in many cases still don't, but um, at, at moments, um, you know, and especially, you know, within those unions that begin to incorporate and or act actively organize immigrants, and then, you know, and undo including undocumented people, begin to push the whole movement, labor movement, um, to the to the left on this question, and that led to workers, uh, excuse me, unions actively supporting a full legalization in, in 1986, uh, and that happened. Uh, Three million or, or so workers were legal, fully legalized, right? Not, not a path to citizenship filled with landmines and disqualifiers, but but an actual process. And the and labor unions played a role in facilitating that for millions of workers. 
And it, and it, what did it, what happened? It literally led to a massive infusion of hundreds of thousands of new workers into unions and a, and a, and a militancy that expressed itself in, in you know, uh, uh, immigrant worker led strikes and struggles, um, you know, through that period of the, of the eighties and nineties. And so um, what happened, the ruling class in this country, they shut down the idea of ever doing that again, of ever having a legalization again, because wages went up across the board, not just for un, uh, immigrant workers, but the threshold was raised and, and, rate, and wages went up. And so this is a way of understanding the war and why we're, we're constantly on the defensive. But, but I'll finish with one example of, of how we can see things moving in, in the other direction, which is cross-border class struggle, class unity, and, and radical and ultimately anti-capitalist demands that emerge from that. Because under the conditions of the most repressive, uh, uh, you know, the most repressive sort of state violence against uh, immigrants, demands for unions can actually be radical and, 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 anti, and anti-capitalist in this context, right? Um, and, and actually organizing them can. So uh, in 19, 2019, there was a, a series of wildcat strikes all across the US-Mexico border on the Mexican side amongst maquiladora workers, Mexican, and, and including Mexican indigenous workers, um, mostly women, um, because there's a, gen, there's a gendering of labor in the maquiladora sector in Mexico. There were 45 wildcat strikes that all won within three week uh, period because of the level of class consciousness and militancy and other factors. Um, and it, sh- it basically shut down um, lar- a large part of, ag- uh, of automotive production in North America because so much of the supply chain production that, that finishes in, 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 in the, the, uh, the production of automobiles comes through these supply chains. There was a strike that same year in GM that, that shut down GM, um, United Auto Workers that shut down GM plants across the country um, and even uh, had a spillover effect to the United Auto Workers in Canada. By the way, the United Auto Workers is in Canada, the United States, but it hasn't operated in Mexico. And that's why wages are so low there. And that's why outsourcing has, has occurred. When, when GM went on strike, workers, uh, Mexican workers at several um, Mexican uh, plants, including uh, General Motors, basically said, we want to unite with you. We want to actually call to spread the strike through GM in, in Mexico and raise the question of common strike demands, common union organization, et cetera. And, and this was coming from workers in Mexico. That, that strike, it, it, if it spread, it could have been a three, it, it could have been a general strike across, the, across North America, which would have shut down one of the largest automotive uh, industries in, in the world. It didn't happen that way because of the, po- the existing politics. But it shows the, the way that in which there can be the potential to unite. There can be the, the, the possibility to build these kind of, uh, of, of struggles that can have truly an, you know, anti-capitalist uh, ramifications. But we need to organize. So that would be, that would be the appeal is, is, is you know, be, part of an, be part of organizing, either you know, join, join local collectives, join you know, um, groups that are doing uh, defensive work, um, uh, do offensive work within your unions, and, and advocate for it. You know, Solidarity, because it, the internationalization of, of capitalism in, in North America uh, it extends not just in auto- automotive, but across uh, virtually all industries now. Thanks, Justin um, and Ashley and Ali. Um, I want to turn to uh, our audience. Um, folks have submitted some um, great questions, and um, there there are two related questions that Justin began answering. Um, one from uh, Jerry Martini, um, what con- concrete role should our labor unions here in the U.S. be playing in the struggle for immigrant justice? And a related question from Alex Wolf: where are places where other workers can follow the leadership of migrant workers? Um, so if anyone want to tackle that. Okay, well, I'll do an easy answer for the labor unions question. Um, uh, the labor unions have to think internationally in terms of organizing, you know, just a simple answer. Uh, you know, multinational corporations haven't been thinking from a national perspective for a long time. For them, there are no borders. They just see the labor pool as one big exploitable pool. And unions, I think, are starting to shift their thinking around this, but I still think that they're still very slow in understanding that an, um, that labor solidarity has to be across borders and that labor organizing has necessarily has to be international organizing because otherwise you're not even starting to deal with 
uh, how to deal with this exploitation. So I'll just share that real quick. I'll also say, you know, there's a, a, a bit of an irony in me answering a question about where non-immigrant workers, how non-immigrant workers should follow migrant workers, right? As my, I'm myself not a migrant, but I think the, there are a few things I think that we can think about, right? No matter what sector we work in, our workplaces are in some way connected to the fate of migrants here or elsewhere, right? And so I think one of the important things that I think about when I am doing organizing is how from the very particular place that I am in, how can I locate myself? Where is my workplace, my community, my city, my social services? Like what are the places that I already am in? And how can I expose and explain the often hidden connections between my situation and the situation of migrant people and migrant workers. Um, you know, for those of us who work in a university setting, as I do, like, where is my pension being invested? Um, in what ways are it, it like are um, my employer contributing to or leaning into contracts with the carceral state or with um, private security companies like G4S that also have contracts on the US's southern border as well as on the separate so-called separation barrier between Israel and Palestine and lots of other places where migrant people are policed. In what ways are the catering companies like there's like a lot we can do and a lot of solidarity that can be formed by actually understanding the material situation that we are already embedded in and then finding ways to to expose the material connection between our situation and, and other workers. I will also say that no matter where you are, there are migrant and undocumented workers in your community. And if you're not already connected to them, connecting with those people and following their leadership, asking the campaigns that they're involved on is one way to start, right? Um, organizing against your local ICE detention and or deportation facility. Um, is an excellent way, I think, especially that people with citizenship privilege can um, take actual risks and put their bodies on the line in order to um, take a, you know, take a stand against the actual machine of vulnerabilization. Um, and so I think rather than there being a sort of one size fits all solution for organizing, my advice is to really understand the place that you are in, to research your own situation, perhaps even more than you already know, in order to find those already existing connection to migrants and migrant communities, and then to use those as a lever for further radicalization and to push for material change in your community and your workplace. Um, and to use that as like the sort of um, springboard toward further larger national and international action. Thank you. I think that's that. Those are really solid suggestions. And thinking also of the labor movement, I would add that with you know, if you're in a union, you uh, you want to look at your union's connections and any coalitions it is in with law enforcement unions, border patrol unions. <laughs> Uh, local law enforcement, you know, police, corrections officers, those are all part of the system that uh, contributes to migrant exploitation and criminalization. So if, if you care about that, an obvious place would be to work on your union, uh, disaffiliating or, you know, and speaking out, kicking out those unions out of the labor movement. Um, we have a couple more questions that I wanna get, get to. There is a question, a practical kind of question, um, from Tess that I like. Um, in your experience, talking to folks who have good-hearted intentions um, and are advocating for immigration reform through the assimilation angle into the system, um, any pointers in how uh, how to in kind of uh, inspire people to see it through a migrant justice lens and the abolitionist lens that we have been discussing so far in conversations. Well, this one's a tough one. So I'm, I'm briefly with the Andaki Black Network, which is part of what I think of as the immigration sort of uh, nonprofit industrial complex. And the, the thing 
that's hard is that people who work in DC who do legislative work are tied to narratives around attaining citizenship and are always making the compromises that they feel they need to make in order to be able to protect a certain amount of, of folks. And that's where I think the abolitionist framing is, is the best. And this is, you know, one of the reasons I was actually hired at Undocu Black was we are participating in a project that is a multi-organizational project where we have connected with uh, undocumented folks from across the spectrum, engaged in conversations with them, and we have been creating an abolitionist platform on, on immigration. And it is just that. It's literally, you know, when people came up with the idea of abolish ICE, uh, you know, our job was basically, okay, if we abolish ICE, what does that look like? And so we had this whole plan of like abolishing ICE, creating this department of migration that's based on people's rights, you know, and we're trying to think about ways in which we can inject some of that language into policy circles. But that is, that's really hard because especially in the nonprofit world, there are a lot of folks who themselves are not undocumented, who I think are very well-meaning, want to fight to try to figure out ways to legalize people, but only see legalization as like, that's the goal, you know? And whereas for a lot of us, like legalization is, not only is it not the goal, but it obscures, and not just that, it obscures and it, it, it excuses the American project of criminalization. Um, you know, the whole sort of American dream kind of framing, you know, it's this, it reinforces this idea that once you've legalized, you can become the citizen and you have access to certain privileges and all of that. And, you know, I always think that it's funny that as immigrants, we are um, talking about something like the American dream, when the American dream doesn't work for US citizens. It hasn't worked for ages, at least since the 80s, you know, and that's where immigrants become scapegoats for what the economy has, has done to regular workers. So I don't have any easy answers, um, but we just need to interrupt those narratives around citizenship if we're gonna get anywhere near towards justice. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think very similar to Ali's last point is like, I think it's really helpful to remind people that citizen workers are still exploited. Citizen workers, right, are, are still subject to racialized and violent regimes of policing. Citizen workers are still subjected to pretty widespread sexual assault. Citizen workers are still subjected to widespread transphobia, right? And so I one of the things that I think is useful is saying like, is recognize, and I, I mean this from like an organizer perspective, right? Not necessarily from an, a, like a, an analysis perspective. I find it very useful when I'm talking to people who have good intentions to validate those good intentions and then to connect their actual desire for the betterment of the situation of undocumented and migrant people to what it would actually require to better that situation, right? Whether individual undocumented people want a path to citizenship or not is not for me to decide. My What I am there to do in this situation or in this context is to say, actually, in order to make good on the, on the real desire you have for the liberation, the well-being, the protection, the um, sort of full life possibilities of currently undocumented people, what we would need to do in order to do that is to abolish the very system that tears workers, that exploits people, and that is based in the reproduction of an inherently unequal, inherently violent system. And so what we, like, in order to make good on your very good intentions, we actually need a much larger frame of reference and a much wider and more expansive transformative vision. So I agree with you. And what we need to do in order to get there is also these other things. Like, that's the organizer response that I would give. There are so many wonderful questions <laughs> that I wish we had time to address, including no one no one so far has questioned the, the, the no bosses part of uh, the title of this uh, panel. But there are some, you know, great questions about 
uh, what does it mean to call for no borders and, uh, and uh, um, various perspectives on that. Um, Unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to, uh, uh, we're going to have to continue this conversation. And speaking of which, um, when we first planned this panel, it was meant to be a kickoff for a convergence of organizers and uh, scholars that would offer space for more of a discussion rather than the panel of anti capitalist organizing in the migrant justice movement. That was supposed to happen tomorrow, but unfortunately, we are postponing that, converge it to a future date, various scheduling. Uh, conflicts happen, but I, if you are interested in participating, uh, and you know, special shout out to folks who've, who've uh, um, added their questions to the Q and A, uh, please indicate so in, either through the Q and A uh, um, tab on the bottom of your screen, or you can uh, contact me directly by email, so you can be invited to the continuing conversation about anti-capitalism, migrant justice. Um, so with that, I want to, of course, thank uh, our panelists for joining us um, in this conversation. I also want to thank our excellent team at CUNY SLU, uh, Michael, Nadia, and Aaron. And a big thank you to uh, Shannon Gleason, Marcel Perret, and Andy Battle, uh, who are part of this larger project and helped organize this event. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming.